What's going on everyone and welcome to another episode of My Shitty Kitchen. Today, we're going to be working with this boneless chuck roast I've got here. We're going to be braising it in cola. I've never done this before. I've got a soda shop right down the street from me and they've got their own cola that's made with a cane sugar instead of a high fructose corn syrup. So, really interested to try this out. I know a lot of people like this method of cooking where they braise in cola and other weird drinks and stuff like that. So, we'll see how this turns out. Let's go ahead and jump over to the prep and get started. So let's talk about the classic pot roast for a second. If you grew up in a semi-normal American household, you've probably had one, and it's no wonder. Pot roast meats, as I like to call them, are relatively cheap for how much they weigh, and they come from a few different areas of the cow. They feed a lot of people, and when prepared properly, are absolutely delicious. Today, we're working with a boneless chuck roast, which comes from the front end of the cow. If you've ever eaten at a barbecue joint, you may have seen or heard of brisket, which comes from the chest area of the cow. And lastly, you've got the round cut, which comes from the back end of the cow near the leg area. This typically comes in the form of a top or bottom round or a rump roast. All of these are great to use for this recipe, but I'm using boneless chuck roast because it has a ton of fat and connective tissue that's going to break down during cooking and leave us with some juicy and flavorful meat. Also, it's pretty much the only roast meat that Walmart had, so, you know. Anyway. For what we're making today here, you'll need your choice cut of meat, in this case a beef boneless chuck roast, about 64 ounces of chicken stock or broth, a cooking oil of your choice. Now, I use grapeseed oil because it has a high smoke point. We're going to sear this roast before braising it, and I want to get the pan as hot as possible without the oil breaking down and igniting. You'll also need about 15 to 20 ounces of a cola of your choice. Now, this is really important. You can only use cola that's made with a natural sugar like cane sugar for this. Chemical sweeteners will absolutely destroy this dish and it'll taste awful. At your grocery store, look for what's called Mexican Coke. It comes in a tall glass bottle and always make sure there's no chemical sweetener in it. Moving on, you'll also need some vegetables. I'm using what's called a mirepoix, which is basically just a rough cut mixture of carrots, celery, and onion. I'm also throwing in some potatoes. If you've got butternut squash on hand, that'll be fantastic in this as well. For bonus points, if you've got multiple types of potatoes laying around, you can also toss those in. Lastly, don't forget your salt and pepper. I always use kosher salt or sea salt because of its large, coarse grain. If you don't have any, go to the store right now and get some. The only time you should use iodized or table salt, as it's called, is when you're making focaccia bread. Now that we've got our ingredients, or mise en place, as it's called, together, it's time to jump into prep. The first thing you want to do is generously season your roast with salt and pepper on both sides. Sides. Forget your Bubba Joe's roast seasoning or whatever weird nonsense that came in a packet that you might have picked up at Cracker Barrel. All you need for good meat is salt and pepper. That's it. Those other things are designed for people that think they can't cook to make you think you're making your food taste better. Well, you're really not. You're just making it taste like something that it isn't. After seasoning, let the meat rest for a few minutes because the salt you put on it is going to draw liquid and you want to make sure you pat both sides dry with a paper towel. This is important because, as I said earlier, we're going to sear this and we want the cut of meat to be as dry as possible. Any liquid on the protein will create steam when it hits the pan. If you have a bunch of steam, it keeps what's called the Maillard reaction from happening. If no Maillard reaction occurs, then you don't get that beautiful deep sear you're looking for. Always pat your protein down before searing. You'll thank me later, I promise. Now that you've beaten your meat and it's dry all over, put a Dutch oven on the stove, pour in some oil, and heat it on high heat until the oil starts smoking. Add your roast to the pan, and if it's hot enough, it'll sound something like this. Now, during the searing process, and this goes for any protein you're trying to get a sear on, it's really important that you don't touch it. Put it in the pan and let it cook. To get a deep enough sear, this process is going to take about four or so minutes for each side. When one side is done, take the roast out of the pan, let the pan heat up again, and if it's still looking a little dry on the bottom, add some more oil. When the pan is hot and smoking again, put the roast back in the pot and repeat the process. Make sure that you've got a spoon handy to baste the roast as well. Pouring hot oil and juices all over the meat allows you to sear any little crevices in the protein that may have not been touched. Once you're done searing, your roast should look something like this. I probably could have gone a little longer on this one, but I think it looks really good, so let's go ahead and move on. Take your Dutch oven, and you'll notice that there's a lot of stuff on the bottom of it. This is called sook, and it's spelled S-O-O-K. 
and you want to keep this. Don't wash the pot out after searing anything because you can pretty much always use this sediment on the bottom to make a pan sauce or something. In this case, the slick is going to make up part of our braising liquid. So here's what we need to do. First, pour in your soda and then heat it to a rapid boil. This is going to deglaze the pot and pull up all that delicious stuff on the bottom. When your soda is boiling, add in your chicken stock and heat that back to a boil as well. Once this mixture reaches a boil, you'll want to cut the heat down from high to around medium so that you get a simmer. Now, you'll want to reduce this mixture by half of its volume by letting it simmer. This allows our flavors to marry and gives our braising liquid a little more body. This will take about 20 to 25 minutes or so. During this time, it's probably a good idea to start prepping your veggies. If you're using potatoes, which you should be, make sure to keep them in water while you're waiting to use them. If you leave peeled potatoes out in the open air, they oxidize very quickly and they get this nasty skin on them. So, while we've got a second, you might still be curious as to why cola is a good choice for something like a roast or any other type of braising meats, and to be honest, I was really curious too, because I've never cooked with soda. You might be surprised to find that the flavor profile of, let's say, Coke, for example, though, is mostly made up of vanilla and cinnamon. On top of that, you've also got spices like nutmeg with maybe a hint of lemon or lime. All of these things are wonderful in savory dishes, and they especially go well on something like a hearty pot roast. Anyway, once your braising liquid has been reduced, it's time to add in, well, pretty much everything. Before you do that, though, make sure to preheat your oven to 325 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, put your roast in first, then add the veggies on top. Don't take it off the stove just yet, though. It's really important that you get your braising liquid up to a boil again, because in the oven, it'll never get hot enough, and you've just added a bunch of room temp or cold ingredients that cooled the liquid down some. The braising liquid should just about cover everything in the pan, and if it doesn't, don't panic. Just add a little bit more chicken stock until everything is covered in liquid. After that, slide the whole thing into the oven and let it cook until it's done. This will take about two to three hours depending on the size of your roast. Now, two to three hours may not seem like a lot of time, but honestly, you only need to cook this until it's tender. I'm sorry, Mom, I love you, but I've got to throw you under the bus here. My mother, and pretty much everyone I've talked to that's ever made a pot roast or braised something, has always prided themselves on how long they leave a piece of meat in the oven. Six hours, ten hours, all day, all night. It's always an extreme amount of time. If you leave something in braising liquid for that long, it's going to look and taste like dishwater by the time you pull it out. You see, there's a common misconception about cooking foods in liquid. People claim that cooking foods in liquid is what makes it juicy. On the contrary, liquids actually leach out the juice in your protein. It's actually fat that keeps things moist, which is why we're using a fatty cut of meat. The more you know. Anyway, after two to three long hours, your house will smell delicious and your roast should be done. But wait, there's more. If you want to make a quick sauce for this, take a few cups of your braising liquid and reduce it down until it starts to thicken. Throw a knob of butter in the pot to butter it out and bam you've got a nice little gravy pan sauce thing to pour over your roast but that's gonna be it for me today folks hopefully you enjoyed this video and maybe you learned something new if you did consider sharing it with your friends and leaving a like down below also if you make this dish or any of the others on this channel send me pictures at my shitty kitchen on twitter or instagram anyway i'll see you all at the next video and as always thank you so much for watching